Hi, I hope everyone's safe out there during lockdown at the moment. Whilst we can't get out and about fishing at the moment, what I want to do over the next few weeks is just relive a few of my own favourite captures and hopefully give you a few sort of tips and edges along the way that might get you on track to, to landing that dream fish of your own. So first one in this little mini series had to be a 31 pound two ounce pike that I caught from a southwest canal back in 2009. The reason I wanted to start with this is not only does this fish mean a hell of a lot to me, but also there's lots of little things that, that I did during the campaign which I think led up to me catching this particular fish uh, and that I truly believe that I probably wouldn't have uh, bumped into it otherwise. So we're going to take the story right back to 2007. I was actually out the country at the time, email pinged up, had a look and it was from a friend, picture of a very big pike that was uh, photographed and uh, the picture appeared in a local paper. So I messaged him back and asked where this fish had come from. Straight away it was clear that not only was it a big pike, but it was a real spectacular looking one and uh, certainly the type of fish that I'd like to uh, have a go at myself. And he came back and said that it was from this particular canal. Now I'd fished the water before and actually had some fish up to 25 and a half pounds from there myself. So it did have some pedigree for, for big pike. Um, it had produced one 30 pounder in the, in the distant past, but it hadn't produced a fish of uh, that size weighed and authenticated for, uh, for, for quite a few years. Um, so when I saw this fish a couple of years before, it was very much on my radar. However, things in life get in the way, and I'd certainly at that time really been targeting the reservoirs because I was after my first 30 pounder. Um, a few weeks prior to, to starting a campaign on this particular canal, my dream came true and I landed my first 30 pounder, um, which was a lure caught fish of 3214 from, from Chew Valley. And whilst I was absolutely over the moon because I'd spent God knows how much money and uh, miles and hours out there chasing big pike all over the UK and, uh, and in parts of Europe as well. It finally meant so much to get this 30 pounder. I was very much ready to go back on the next campaign and the, the canal was a very local venue to me at that time. Um, and I just felt that that was the time. There seemed to be a small number of very big pike in there that were just reaching their peak, not too much angling pressure. And it just seemed a natural place for, for, for me to fish. I spent a little bit of time walking the venue during the summer. For me, this is really, really important. Um, I don't just want to turn up in November because I don't know what the weed beds are like. You turn up and it all looks the same, whereas in the summer, you can see where the deeper parts are, where the weed isn't reaching the surface. You can see where prey fish are moving. You get a lot more idea of, uh, of what's going on. Um, I probably fish a little bit differently to a lot of pike anglers in terms of I do like to spend that time looking at venues out of season or out of the traditional pike fishing season plumbing up, finding the areas, find the, finding the features. Um, in fact, I was rereading a, a, an old John Wilson book quite recently, uh, and his words were, if a pike angler doesn't know the depth of the water that he's casting his bait into, he doesn't deserve to catch a pike. And I think that that really does ring true. You see a lot of sort of chuck it and chance it, uh, bait fishing in particular going on, um, but I really like to, to, to focus in on, on certain areas. Anyway, spent some time on the venue. It's different from most traditional canals that are maybe... 10 15 meters wide and a few foot deep this is an old shipping canal so it's up to 50 meters 60 meters wide in places average about 25 meters 14 foot deep would be the sort of average depth down the middle uh, and it's quite uniform as well now this can create problems in its own right because the fish can of course be anywhere now they will move around and follow prey fish but there's no real reason for them to be in any particular area for a length of time. So after a, a bit of a sort of stalled start to the campaign where I landed a few fish but never really felt like I was doing anything different from anyone else, I decided to make my own hotspots. And this, for me, is where this campaign really started to turn. So what I started doing, I started using all my old dead baits from, from uh, fishing elsewhere, all the old hook baits and bits and pieces, the, the half baits that were left over. Um, and started putting those into the spots that I was fishing. So if I fancied fishing somewhere, I'd put some bits and pieces in a few days before and then drop on there. And whilst it did work, I felt I needed to take it a step further and actually get the big pike really resident in the areas that I'd identified that might be worth a go. So what I wanted to do was get them used to finding food in an area and then provide them with an ongoing food source there. So quite simply, those big old lazy pike didn't need to move. And I know from doing this on other natural venues, this is an absolute killer method. Um, so what I started doing was going to the supermarkets in the evening just before they closed. And to begin with, I was quite fussy. I was picking up the sardines, the sprats, the herrings, the mackerel 
the type of thing that we'd clip on a pair of treble hooks and cast out as a hook bait. But what I quickly learned is it doesn't need to be the conventional hook baits that you use for pre-baiting. They will quickly learn to pick up anything and recognize it as food. You know, whether that be a, a farmed sea bass or whether that be a tuna steak, they will quickly learn that food is food. Now, for those of you that are doing this for the first time and are worrying about it being the things that you normally use on a hook, think about it this way. When you turn up on a water that you've never fished before for pike and you cast out a half a mackerel, that pike's probably never seen a mackerel before. So it's, it's absolutely no different. It's just introducing different things uh, for bait. What I do now when I'm pre-baiting in any quantity, instead of relying on the supermarket baits, I tend to buy my pre-baits. So loose baits, gadder baits, both two that I'd recommend that do bulk pre-bait. Really, really cheap. Get yourself a cheap spare freezer um, and, then, and then just fill it up with pre-bait. It doesn't cost much to do, but trust me, this makes a massive, massive difference to your predator fishing results. So I identified two areas and started the bait going in. I was putting a couple of kilos in two or three times a week uh, and all of the pre-baiting that I did was during hours of darkness. A couple of reasons for that. One, it was the handiest time, either very, very early in the morning before work or in the evening after work. So it kind of made sense. Secondly, there were a few anglers on the venue, um, but there was quite a lot of walkers, bikers, um, boats going up and down. If I turned up with a bucket, started lobbing big pieces of fish into the canal someone would see and probably walk along and say to the next angler they say oh what's the what's the guy down there doing throwing fish in there so to keep it nice and low key i started putting bits and pieces of bait in under the cover of darkness now i did tell the the story i don't know uh, uh probably ten yeah eight eight nine years ago now um in uh, in a pike fishing book at the time but one of the things that i didn't mention was about how i used marker baits really really successfully to tell when the baits were being eaten now this is a really good way of not only telling if fish are feeding on your pre-bait but secondly when they're doing it as well so there's two methods that i use when i'm uh, when i'm using marker baits if i'm baiting up very close to the bank i simply tie a larger heavy dense dead bait such as a, a half a mackerel or a herring to natural cotton now it needs to be a natural cotton not a modern nylon cotton so please make sure you buy the right thing for this because it makes a big difference to what you're doing what i'd do was keep it tied to the spool throw the bait out there to where i'm pre-baiting let it sink and remember this only if you're doing it within a few meters of the bank sink the cotton down under the water and just tie it off to a reed stem or you could put a peg under the water or, or whatever just something so that it, it'll uh, stay there uh, a branch anything else like that make sure it's tucked out of the way so no one sees it now the reason that we use the uh, the natural cotton first it will rot in water it loses its strength very very quickly when it's soaked so when miss mr or hopefully mrs pike comes along picks it up as soon as they start to eat it the cotton just breaks Pike eats it and gone. Remember, we're not putting loads of these out. This is just one occasionally to see if things are getting eaten. Um, if you do that with a, a, a nylon cotton, like I said, it doesn't rot in the water and it's a lot stronger as well. Um, whereas this stuff, if a, a bird swims through it or anything else, it'll, it'll just break and it only leaves something that disappears in the water in no time at all. Now, if I'm pre-baiting a little bit further from the bank, for instance, in the middle of the canal or, or on a pit or whatever, then what I tend to do is get that again, a nice big dead bait that's going to stay in, in place, wrap cotton round it, so slightly longer than the depth of the water. And on the end of it, I'll tie a natural wine cork. I normally just use half of a cork. And um, it's really important that as with a cotton, with the cork, use natural um, because obviously that's biodegradable and it will break down. Whereas again, modern corks, like cotton they use a lot of plastic in them which is basically just litter in the water and not something that you'd want to leave around tie that on there throw it out or bait boat it out or however you want to put it out there then as it sinks down unravels corks on the surface and there's your marker um like i say not only does it tell you if it's been eaten but if for example you're um throwing it in there just as the light goes in the evening and going back with a torch in the morning see if your marker's still there um you'll know if it's a night feeding or day fishing situ uh, feeding situation at that stage, which will tell you not only if it's the, the right place to be fishing, but also the right time to be fishing as well. So a real edge. Not one that I use all the time. And like I said, it's got to be used uh, sparingly and, uh, and in the right way, but very, very effective. Um, 
So I started using marker baits in two spots occasionally in amongst the pre baits. So every couple of weeks I'd put a marker bait out and it didn't take long on one spot before they started disappearing. So that's my cue. Um, it avoids a lot of wasted time if I can drop into a spot knowing there's big pike there picking up the pre bait. First session on, uh, on that particular spot, got the baits out in the dark in the morning, um, opted for very, very simple rigs. Um, anyone that's ever fished with me will know that I just fish very simple, strong tactics. My uh, my concentration is on is on putting the bait in the right spot where the fish are, um, and then presenting them with something they want to eat. I'm I'm not a riggy angler for 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 any species at all. Simple running ledger, three and a half ounce running lead ledger stem, um, forty pound forty nine strand trace. Uh, and two two treble hooks. I was tending to use bigger hooks then, sort of fours and occasionally sixes. I do tend to use slightly smaller hooks and baits now than uh, than I probably did then. Hook bait wise, although I'm throwing lots of different things in, I really believe that there's times when pike can be quite fussy about what they pick up. <clears throat> there's days when we've probably all experienced this. It doesn't matter what you cast out. You could put a bluey on the end, you can put a mackerel on the, on the end and you'll keep catching pike. Those are the days when it's high on the feeding scale um, and they'll eat whatever you throw at them. However, if you're fishing for, for big, well-fed fish or on the days when the feeding scale isn't so high, there's definitely better baits to be using. And for me, and I know this correlates with some, some other anglers as well, low oil baits tend to be more successful. So I'm thinking maybe a pollen, uh, a dead roach, smelt is a standout bait for me. And one thing that I do tend to do with my baits and have done for a long time now, um, although I don't think I talked about it when, uh, when I wrote about this particular capture previously, is balance the baits. <clears throat> the reason that I do this when I've used the Water Wolf cameras and looked back at the uh, at the footage afterwards, and also when I've watched Big Pike feeding in clear water, when I've had Big Pike come in and look at a bait, the success rate in terms of turning it from a fish that comes in, looks and turns away to actually a pickup has been a lot higher with a neutral buoyancy bait. The reason I think for that is when they come in, they can't help but move the bait. Um, when they're tasting, so they're breathing through their gills to get the, the scent going over their receptors, and also when they're fanning their fins to hold themselves in position, it just makes the bait bounce along the bottom. And I just neutrally make them neutrally buoyant, so they just settle with a head facing up, tail on the bottom. If it's too buoyant, I'll just put a split shot underneath, very lightly on the wire trace. Um, just do it lightly so it doesn't damage it, so it just sits on the bottom like that and if anything comes near it it just moves along and that little bit of movement they don't think is alive or anything else but it just seems to install a bit of confidence and, and, and personally um, I've had a much better conversion rate in visual situations by by using those type of baits so those were the chosen baits because I knew that I had a chance of, uh, uh, of a really big fish off there at that time cast them out fill them down as I always did I knew from casting around in the summer this was uh, quite a deep clear area with weed around it Cast it out, got a good drop on it, and cast the other rods out around it. Now, from pre-baiting previously, if there's one thing I know, it's you need to be prepared. Because firstly, takes often come very, very quickly over pre-baited spots. And secondly, very often your first bite will be the biggest fish in the lake or river or whatever. Because they home in, they push the other fish out, and they stay there. They just live on those areas. So when I had a take quite quickly, as you can imagine, I was pretty excited. Wound down struck into it and straight away it was clear it was a very powerful fish it was stripping braid off of the reel rod was right over um, and there was weed pinging up all over the swim as this fish kited hard to the right hand side up the main channel now it was still quite early season and the fish quite quickly got bogged down in the weed that horrible feeling we've all had as, as it grates and grates and just grinds to a halt so i pulled just wasn't really getting anywhere in the end i put the rod down got the braid and actually just started getting it moving by by hand and then picked the rod back up and carried on. Got it moving and eventually after probably about five minutes of slowly getting pulling a huge weed bed back to me, in front of the landing net I had a weed bed that was probably around the size of a pool table. In amongst it little swirls were coming up, I knew that underneath there somewhere was a really good sized pike. Now in my own fishing, I tend to use a rigid round frame net with a latex mesh. Um, I find that when you've got fish in weedy waters and things like that, it's just so much easier to scoop them up with a solid frame, particularly for a long bodied fish like, like pike and catfish. However, I'd been out on a magazine feature a couple of days before. 
laziness on my part I hadn't changed the net back over from the triangular one that I'd used on the feature and obviously as we all know the drawstring on the front can, can collapse down under the weight which can cause problems so I managed to get it underneath this weed bed pulled the whole lot towards me and started pulling this weed apart to see what I caught found the lead found the top of the trace and as I pulled it all apart I came face to face with an absolutely huge pike. I was in absolutely no doubt this was a 30 pounder. Non-trout water, never been caught before over, over the magic mark, and there it was. I believed that it was there, I'd baited successfully, and it looked like it was gonna be mine. However, the fish was hooked on the hook on the end of the treble, just for one point, right on the end of the jaw, and the top treble was in the drawstring with a fish on the outside. So very gently, I just tried to pull the net forward, hoping that I'd be able to scoop the fish up however it just shook its head and just used that little bit of tension to unhook itself turn so i saw it side on and then it just swam down the down the drop off and out of sight gin clear water so i got a really good look at it side on and across its back as it went and that just cemented in my mind how big this thing was yes it was painful it felt like i could have reached out and touched it i over the next few days i thought of a hundred different ways what i should have done what i could have done differently however i put the rest of the pre-bait that i had in with me just packed up there and went there and then and headed home because i felt the fish hadn't been hugely stressed by by getting hooked it had basically run got bogged down in the weed got dragged towards the bank unhooked itself and swam off so i didn't think that it probably had the stress that it would have got if it had actually been a capture so four days later I decided I'd get back in that spot. I'd put some more pre-bait in. I just hoped that after those few days, she might have just started to feed again and it was worth a go. So dropped back in there. It was a Monday morning um, and I was confident. Conditions were good again, uh, just how I liked it on there. And um, I was so confident, in fact, that I rang a, a friend of mine, asked if he wanted to come down because I said, I think I'm going to catch it. So he came down with me on the day. He was lure fishing, so he kind of wandered off. He didn't want to do anything to, to kind of get in the way of the capture because he knew that the effort had really kind of been put in on my part. And at that point, he wasn't fishing it quite as regularly. Um, and it wasn't long before the same rod again. As soon as the, the sun lifted over the horizon, the other side of the, the canal in front of me, drop off went exactly the same thing another big battle however i'd made one slight change to the rig in those few days on my ledger stems i'd taken the little snap link off and i just tied the leads on so i'd use three and a half four ounce leads as i normally would and just tied them to the bottom of the uh, ledger stem with uh, with six or eight pound line just with a couple of overhand knots so this time as soon as that big pike shook its head when i wound down the leads pinged off and most of the fight was the fish, fish charging around the top. It was an absolutely brilliant fight and it was clear again that it was a really, really big fish. So I was relieved to see it in the net. Um, I rang my friend as he was only a few hundred metres away and he came back down and we were face to face with this, this big old pike. So we got everything ready, zeroed everything up. I'd already cast the rod back out. First thing I do on any big fish capture, leave it in the net or pop it in a, in a sling, unclip new rig on back out doesn't matter if it's the biggest fish in the lake get that rod back out there the day that the big fish are feeding is the day to put in 110 percent i hear of so many people saying oh, i caught that fish i'm so happy i went home those are the days to stay on an extra hour stay on an extra night they're not the days to go home early because if the, if one big one's feeding they probably all are anyway she was in the net we got her out and straight away i knew this wasn't the fish it was very, very long, arguably even longer than the uh, fish that I felt was over 30 pounds that I'd lost a few days before, but it was quite a sleek fish. She weighed just over 25 pounds, which for any pike, let alone a canal pike, I was absolutely over the moon with, but I was absolutely 100% sure it wasn't the fish that, uh, that I'd lost. So we'll just take, a, we'll just take a, a quick look at that one. And as you can see, absolutely amazing canal pike, but still felt there was bigger to come now most times when you lose a big fish you feel your chance has gone but there was just something about this fish having come so close to it having a plan that seemed to have worked i just for some reason felt i'd get another shot at it so i kept the pre-bait going in um, but what i quickly learned is on that spot it just seemed to burn out quite quickly pre-bait wasn't getting eaten a couple times i put marker baits in they didn't go um and it just felt like the fish had moved on. Now this could have been because the fish that were in the area and had settled in the area had moved on because of captures, 
um, whether that be the fish that I lost, the 25, the smaller fish that I had from there, um, or it might have just been a seasonal change um, that led to the fish moving around and, and settling in elsewhere. But anyway, I kept the bait going in between the two spots that I'd identified and I still hadn't fished the second spot. Just kept the bait going in under darkness. Um, moving forward a, a few weeks of, uh, of regular baiting, one particular weekend I was due to go down to the Stour to, to fish for chub and I woke up to, to get up at, I don't know, 2, 3 in the morning, whatever whatever silly time I was getting up to, to drive down to Dorset and I didn't feel well at all. felt really under the weather. I'd been fishing quite a bit the, the previous couple of weeks. I didn't fancy the drive. I didn't fancy standing out, kind of trotting, light line fishing all day in, in, in relatively poor conditions. Um, so I decided I'd go and fish the second swim. Took the chub gear out, put the pike gear in, got some baits out the freezer and headed down there. Um, now to get to the spot or to get to the particular stretch where uh, where I was fishing, you drive across uh, a nature reserve that has uh, an access road going through it. However, it's part of a tidal marsh and it can flood with a combination of flood water and particularly high tides. I hadn't checked the tides and got there to find that there was absolutely no way I was getting through. And of course, when I've taken my chub gear out, I've taken my chest waders out. So I had to drive round and had a pretty long walk, albeit a flat one along the towpath, to get to uh, to get to the second swim. Um, I pretty much jogged down with with the gear because the light was starting to come up, and I wanted to get those those baits in there for what is so often the best part of the day. Got there, uh, and in this particular spot, I'd put four rods in on that day. I fished, put two out on the spot, and then my outside rods, my right, my left hand, again with the heavy running ledges, I could walk down and fish other spots. 50, 100 yards along the canal, all four rods directly in front of me, but with the baits walked down to try some different spots on those outside ones in case the fish were, were in the area but not sat right on the pre-bait. Anyway, barely got a chance to, to get the outside ones out. And again, first take very, very quick on the pre-bait. I'll never forget to this day, winding down. And this fish must have been absolutely motoring because I, I clacked the bail arm over, started to wind down. And before I even felt the resistance to, to lift into, I looked down and the clutch was already going on the big pit reel and I was in direct contact and she was taking line. Um, it felt like a good fish, but at this stage I didn't know how big. Um, came up over, over the drop off. And as the light was starting to come up, I couldn't really see how big. I could see it was a decent fish. I could feel it was a decent fish. But it wasn't until she went into the net and I just knelt down and looked and I realised not only was it a huge pike, but it was the one that clearly had my name on it that I'd lost just a few weeks before on the first spot. Um, at that point, usual thing, unclip, rob back out, even though I've got a big fish in the net. Um, and then I started ringing rounds, just sat with the fish in the net to, to try and get someone to come down and do the photos. Um, that particular morning, when I left and decided that I'd go to the canal instead of the stour, I'd text one of my friends who was fishing the canal at that stage and told him where I was kind of heading, see see if he wanted to catch up. And I'd noticed that he hadn't uh, seen the message yet. So I just kept trying to ring him, kept trying to ring him, kept my on the fish in the net. And I thought, if this takes any length of time, I'll do a mat shot, I'll do a self-take. I didn't want to just let a dog walker do it or a random angler who might be coming along because at that stage people didn't realize what was in the venue and the last thing i wanted to do was even if my plan would have been to move on for it to get a load of pressure hence the fact we're still not naming the water even uh, what 10 years after the capture um so um so eventually my mate rang me back and he'd just seen my message and said he'd be on his way down and when i told him what i had in the net he turned up pretty quick uh that's my friend steve moore so massive thanks to to steve for that uh, and also to danny parkins who also got there around the same time having uh having got my uh got my call uh so they both turned up there we got the fish out weighed it did the pictures and i've got still my favorite picture of her has to be and just pop it up to a bigger size there we go i think that that picture there is is still my favorite i'll never forget because as i said i take my chest waders out as they were in my chub gear and when I lowered myself in to do those return shots it was only when I lowered myself into that freezing cold water that I realized I had my wellies and my bib and brace on and <laughs> not the waders so um so as you can imagine it was uh, a pretty cold and wet walk back to the van although I didn't really notice that much I've got the the traditional 
grab and grin shot of it there as well for those who want. As you can see, it's absolutely amazing looking pipe. The head on it, I mean, you can see I'm holding that against the body. I wasn't going to take any risks kind of holding a, a fish of that size out. You didn't need to. It's just epic in size. If you look at the size of its head, I just remember when I unhooked it, just the, the size of its head was unbelievable. And that's easily a fish that could avoid capture by, by eating other prey items, whether that be small jack pike, tench, bream. It could easily engulf a fish of three, four pounds quite comfortably. It had absolutely massive head on it. Um, but there was other anglers on there at the time and, and my results really stood out simply due to the fact I had the fish in front of me before I fished each time. So the location side of it on a very uniform venue had already been dealt with. Like I say, they were there waiting for me with the pre-baiting. I'd brought them to where I wanted them. And also with the occasional use of marker baits, I'd also made sure I knew firstly that they were there and they were feeding. And secondly, when through checking them as regularly as I could as well. Um, so yeah, cam the campaign had come together, £31, two ounce. And like I say, still to, still to this day, absolutely one of my favorite captures that, uh, that that i've ever had and one that at the time um at the time i was putting a huge amount of effort into my fishing i still don't believe to this day i've ever had to put as much effort or, or thought into a campaign that fish literally haunted me until it was in my net knowing that there was a, a, a potentially huge pike in there putting in that effort losing it literally out of the net and then going on to catch it again really kind of stands out for me as uh, as a really, really special capture. Now, I said at the start that I'd be looking to try and do one of these every week for, for, for lockdown, realistically. Um, so next week, I've chosen one. I am open to people's ideas. If there's a fish that, that, that you'd like me to kind of go into a few more details about, more than happy to do it. I've got a few ideas in the back of my head. Um, and I'm just going to opt for ones where I did things a little bit different, if, uh, if that's okay with everyone. But if there's a capture that you want me to go into some more details, perfectly happy to do so. My plan for next week is a slightly different one, and it's one that, again, I haven't I haven't talked about that much. Don't I don't think I publicised it or, or in any great detail at the time, but it's a special one. It was an under-the-radar one. And interestingly, it was only about a mile or so from uh, from that very big pike. This will be the story of a very big uh, linear carp the, that lived in uh, a tidal stretch, uh, an estuarine stretch it spent a lot of its time um, that I saw a picture of and just had to get my hands on so I'll just show you a, a, a quick picture of what I'm talking about ahead of uh, ahead of the next one as you can see it was absolutely exquisite but a lot went into that capture some good little edges quite a bit of subterfuge along the way um, I look forward to telling you all about that so have a safe week everyone and we'll speak again next week